There are a few different ways to conceptualize Francis Ford Coppola as a filmmaker. There's Coppola the Giant, the leading auteur in the auteur-driven New Hollywood, dominating the 70s with a series of undisputed masterpieces. There's Coppola the Fallen Idol, the maker of mercenary studio movies which occasionally touched greatness, but never lived up to the promise of his glory years. And there's Coppola the Experimenter, the mad visionary, reorganizing the aesthetic principles of Hollywood filmmaking and perpetually tinkering with his own work. But of all the ways we think of the man, we rarely, if ever, think of him as a horror director. Which is a little strange given Coppola has directed no less than three horror films. That's only half a horror film less than so-called master of horror John Landis. And these aren't just vaguely spooky, like some of the Bergman movies I talked about last year. These are full-blown horror flicks. One is about an axe-murdering psychopath, one is about a horror writer who meets the ghost of a vampire child, and one is… you know, Dracula. Maybe it's because none of Coppola's horror films are typically considered among his major works. Landis may not have made a lot of horror movies, but An American Werewolf in London is most certainly among his most popular movies, and for my money is also quite clearly his best. Coppola's most popular horror film is Dracula, and while successful, it's not revered like the Godfather films or Apocalypse Now are. That leaves Dementia 13, a Roger Corman-produced quickie that came and went back in 1963, and Twixt, a late-period oddity which never even received a theatrical release in North America and mostly bewildered the few critics who saw it. Reception of both works has remained decidedly mixed, and the films are not widely seen, left mostly for Coppola completionists. In a filmography full of unprecedented commercial triumphs and failures, of critical darlings and misunderstood masterpieces, Coppola's horror films are a footnote. Except that isn't true. These films may not be the most essential to film culture, but they are highly significant in Coppola's body of work. We are talking about his debut feature, a midpoint career comeback after a shaky decade of compromise, and what was, until very recently, his last film. Spanning nearly 50 years, these horror films trace the trajectory of Coppola's career. The transformation from the young student desperate to get into the movies by any means necessary, to the commercially minded Hollywood power player, to the old master content to make movies primarily for himself. Though these films share some elements, like gothic iconography and an interest in life after death, there are also radical differences in aesthetics and intent, expressing Coppola's own shifting vision and the diverse range of horror as a means of realizing it. Indeed, the horror cinema of Francis Ford Coppola is far more than a footnote. It is among the richest and strangest areas in the man's filmography, revealing of his life, craft, and artistry. In this video, I will examine what draws Coppola to horror, how his films can be contextualized within the broader genre, and how his use of the horror movie as a means of expression has evolved over time. So let's start with a simple question. Why did Coppola make these horror movies? No doubt there are all sorts of specific goals and points of attraction for each project, but there is a commonality between all three, and that's money. Dracula came at a point where Coppola's poor finances throughout the 80s had finally caught up with him, having declared bankruptcy a third time and needing to turn to commercial entertainments to pay off his debts, first with a new Godfather sequel, and then with a big studio horror film. Dementia 13 and Twixt emerged less from their prospective box office grosses than from the relative cheapness of their production. The latter came well after Coppola's time working with major studios, and was instead self-funding small-budget movies to explore his own thematic interests and aesthetic experimentation. A movie about a horror writer who investigates a series of murders in a small town while developing a new novel fits nicely into that mold of modest, self-sustained projects. The cast and crew could be kept small, most of the shoot could take place on Coppola's own Napa Valley estate, 
and the nature of horror allows for a degree of spectacle at relatively low costs. A similar necessity informed Coppola's debut. The young Francis was in Europe as a sound man and second unit director on the Roger Corman-produced The Young Racers. Corman, looking to maximize his investment from moving a film production to Europe, offered Coppola his first shot at directing a feature film. If he had an idea for a movie that could be shot in Ireland quickly on a $20,000 budget while they were still overseas. Coppola pitched a Hitchcock-inspired thriller, which involved an axe murderer and the mysterious death of a child. This kernel became Dementia 13, written on the fly and shot over nine days. Now, it should be noted that at no point was Coppola ever forced to make a horror movie. All of these films were his choice. He could have pitched any number of exploitation movies to Roger Corman. He chose horror. He could have made, and indeed did make, all manner of commercial entertainments throughout the 80s and 90s. He chose horror. Hell, by the 2010s, Coppola had become rather wealthy through his wine business and was under no obligation to make any movies at all. He still chose horror, twixt a passion project born out of a dream he had. Coppola has also shown enthusiasm for horror as a genre, and especially Dracula, speaking nostalgically about being taken to the Bela Lugosi film as a kid by his older brother August, and his love for Bram Stoker's original novel. Coppola had a very real interest in the genre. Dracula and Twixt both contain visual references and homages to several horror classics. Dementia 13's structure is modeled directly off Psycho, introducing a woman protagonist with a criminal scheme to take a vast sum of money before she is suddenly killed at the midpoint by a mad slasher, and the financial goals which first propelled the story are abandoned. There is love in Coppola's familiarity with the iconography and structures of horror fiction, but it would also be naive to pretend Coppola wasn't also aware of the economic advantages the genre offered. By his own admission, his pitch for Dementia 13 was largely about appealing to Corman's tastes and the kinds of movies he specialized in. Twixt may have been spurred by Coppola's dream, but the fact that it made it into production in 2009 and Megalopolis didn't almost certainly had more to do with the former being a far more feasible production than it did Coppola's strict passion for the material. Even his stated interest in horror has limits. At one point Coppola had intended to follow Bram Stoker's Dracula with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but ultimately shifted to a producing role when he realized, and this is in his own words, there were probably better uses of his time. Coppola's next film was instead Jack, so feel free to question his judgment in this matter. Bottom line, Coppola's horror films were spurred by economic necessity rather than a strict artistic curiosity. But this isn't anything new. Of the big four films Coppola directed in the 70s, only one of which was born strictly from his passion for the material. The Godfather was a job Coppola took because he was broke, a familiar position he would be in many times over. The Godfather Part II was a concession for Paramount to fund the conversation, and Apocalypse Now was a project Coppola inherited when George Lucas dropped out of directing. None of these films were intended from the jump to be Coppola's major works. They became his major works by virtue of their qualities. In turn, we should not be dismissive of Coppola's horror films just because they were made for economic reasons. Moreover, Regardless of why Coppola is drawn to a project, once he's committed, he tends to go all the way, directing as if the film is the most important he's ever made and willing to fight tooth and nail for every choice he believes in. Like, fine, I'll direct this gangster movie because I need the money, but also no one but Marlon Brando can play Vito Corleone and I do not care how much Paramount hates it, that's the way it's gonna be. Fine, I'll make a Godfather sequel to get my passion project funded, but also it's going to have this ambitious flashback structure paralleling the rise of the father with the fall of the son, while deliberately denying many of the first movie's pleasures by pushing the series and character into darker and more unsavory territory. Fine, I'll make Apocalypse now if George won't, but also I will mortgage everything I own to get this movie made, and I am willing to die for it if that's what it takes. The production stories of Coppola's horror films tend to be less dramatic, but his ambitions are just as evident. Each of these movies was essentially a test of Coppola's craft. 
This is most obvious in Dracula's gargantuan visual spectacle and the traditional means by which Coppola and his team achieve that spectacle. The film makes liberal use of old school movie trickery, models, matte paintings, rear screen projection. Even something as simple as a body double and an empty frame to simulate a mirror. Everything is shot on built sets rather than on location. Every visual effect is achieved in camera. And it looks it. Dracula does not try to convince you that its images are real. It revels in its own artifice, demands you appreciate its beauty as a cinematic construction. Coppola makes this tribute to early cinema trickery overt when Dracula visits a carnival and a projector screens early silent films, where jump cuts or a negative camera image serve as special effects. To underline the point, the sequence begins with footage shot by a hand-cranked path camera, the same technology used in the silent era. The consciously dated imagery, accompanied by the whirl of the camera on the soundtrack, all reaffirm Dracula a cinematic illusion. In this respect, the film is a direct continuation of Coppola's One from the Heart, which similarly flaunted its cinematic artifice and influence from a bygone era of filmmaking. The big difference is that One from the Heart was enamored with the Technicolor musicals of old Hollywood, and that was reflected in a dazzling wonderland of romance and beauty. Dracula's cinematic lineage is older, and it's rooted in trickery and deceit rather than strict wonderment. Taken in tandem with the film's rooting in horror, Dracula's artificial world is not one of free-flowing fantasy, but oppressive force. The film is as beautiful as one from the heart, possibly more so depending on your tastes, but its gothic trappings, visions of monstrosity, and sense of powerlessness in the face of evil distinguish Dracula from its musical predecessor. The effect is similar to that of German Expressionism, a cinematic imaginary of a world of horror. If Dracula is a work of analog film experimentation, Twixt is its digital equivalent. Artifice is not found in elaborate special effects or production value, it's found in the glossy sheen of digital cinematography, with its smoothed over textures and sickly colors. This isn't just a result of a low budget and less resources either, Coppola shot Tetra with the exact same camera a year prior, and that film generally looks sharper and more conventionally cinematic. This is a style Coppola is actively pursuing. And digital artifice is found elsewhere too. Consider the fact that the nighttime scenes where Hall crosses into the dream world were in fact all shot in broad daylight, before being heavily processed in digital post-production. Further post-work was done to give a colored glow to V, the vampire child Hall meets in the dream world, and a handful of color elements and light sources, while the rest of the scenes are in black and white. The result of this extensive tinkering is a sense of disconnect. Individual components of the image have been so thoroughly processed and reworked, they feel separate from the whole, like their lighting sources and colors clash from the rest of the scene, because in essence, they do. So unnatural is the effect that certain images feel like the actors were shot against green screens and have been composited together. But that isn't actually true. Twixt was shot on location. Even in small ways, Coppola shows an interest in digital aesthetics. Rather than just record a Skype call between Hall and his wife, Coppola opts for a digital split screen. The jagged lines around each's frame evokes the analog quality of torn pages but in practice, this only re-emphasizes the digital tinkering, as this effect is quite obviously not achieved naturally and has been digitally manufactured. This very modern film aesthetic is juxtaposed by very traditional signifiers of horror, gothic architecture, a looming clock tower, a vampire girl who looks like she could be Lucy's kid cousin. Autumn Parker commented on this visual strategy in a recent essay, writing, quote, the shiny artificial textures of the digital camera contrast with the film's more archaic gothic structures and shadowy forests, creating an uncanny and dreamlike feeling. Indeed, Twixt's digital elements are most clearly pronounced in the scenes where Hall crosses into the dreamscape, the unreality of digital well suited to the unreality of the situation. And beneath this aesthetic experimentation, 
is one of the most transparently personal stories Coppola has ever told on film. Surface parallels between life and art are immediately apparent. Hall is a novelist who at one point achieved great success, but has since fallen on hard times, struggling with money, unable to live up to his early work, and forced to debase himself to make ends meet. You don't need a degree in film studies to see a little bit of Francis in that portrait. Granted, most movies about artists usually feature some degree of self-insert, and it's not like Hall mirrors Coppola exactly. He is very much a horror writer, where Coppola has never been thought of as a pulp genre filmmaker. But the details of Hall's personal life start to become more specific. Hall is grieving the death of his daughter as the film opens, and we eventually learn the cause of her death was a speedboating accident. An accident which eerily mirrors how Coppola's own son, Gio, died in 1986. Circumstances are not exact, but they're way too close to be coincidence. Twixt emerges then as an expression of the struggle to make art, as creative exercise and as profession, in the wake of grief, and its most powerful scene is when Hall is faced with that grief directly. Only when he does so, can he move forward as an artist. In this context, Dementia 13 might seem the odd man out. It isn't self-conscious of film form, nor does it express a deep personal truth for Coppola. But it's also easy to take this narrative too far. First off, just because Coppola doesn't have a self-insert doesn't mean Dementia 13 doesn't express anything personal. Film historian Peter Cowie has argued the film in fact embodies two of Coppola's dominant themes, the turmoil within the family and the perverse sense of loyalty family entails. Is it overstating things to say the betrayals within the Halloran family predict the decay of the Corleone Empire? Possibly, but it's certainly curious that, when designing a horror story, Coppola immediately turned to familial strife. This conflict even reoccurs in his subsequent horror films, in Mina's twin infidelities to both Jonathan and Dracula, and of course in Hall's fractured marriage and grief for his daughter. On that note, while entirely coincidental, there's still something ominous about the haunting death of the Halloran family being a child who died on the water given Geo's boating accident. There's something ominous, in fact, that the first scene in the first feature film of Coppola's directorial career is a man dying on a boat. And while Dementia 13's style is mostly just functional, it's important to remember this was Coppola's first feature. The test wasn't, can I expand my style? It was, can I make a movie? Can I generate suspense? Can I deliver a shocking horror set piece? Can I tell a coherent story? Functional may be faint praise for the director of The Godfather, but for the guy who was shooting additional nude scenes for the American release of The Bellboy and The Playgirls, it was a breakthrough. Rewatched all these years later, I wouldn't call Dementia 13 a great movie, but its efficiency is remarkable. Within seconds, Coppola establishes tension between John and his wife Louise in framing and camera distance, while the ensuing dialogue lays out motivations. Louise wants her mother-in-law's inheritance, but can only get it so long as she stays in good graces with John. You're only a member of the family as long as you're my wife. If I die before mother, you're a stranger. But then John suffers a heart attack, and Louise races desperately to get back to shore before John dies, and the widowed Louise is left out of the inheritance. But she fails, and rather than accept defeat, Louise dumps John's corpse in the lake to hide his death. In just under four minutes, we have conflict which also develops plot and character, a dramatic twist, and a violent decision which will propel the narrative, culminating in the ghoulish image of a sinking corpse. It is a strong foundation for the horror to follow that also delivers in genre thrills in its own right. And Dementia 13 keeps up this momentum, each scene introducing new story dynamics or expanding the characters while occasionally punctuating the action with a shock horror set piece. It's not high art, and it's not even exceptional pulp horror cinema. You can smell the psycho ripoff vibes right down to the overly expository psychiatrist. But the film proved Coppola could make a movie, 
and it's that foundation which eventually allowed for the more formally adventurous and personally rooted horror cinema to emerge in the decades to come. So, we've established that the horror cinema of Francis Ford Coppola is more than a footnote, that these works are in fact highly significant to Coppola's artistic development, useful in gauging his craft and themes. But there's another, simpler question we need to address. Are they actually scary? Because that's what it's really all about, right? Like, we can debate the thin parameters of genre classification, but the ultimate test of a horror movie is the simple one laid out in The Bad and the Beautiful. When an audience pays to see a picture like this, what do they pay for? To get the pants scared off them. Do Coppola's horror films scare the pants off an audience? That's maybe an unfair question given how subjective it is. Airplane doesn't cease to be a comedy just because it doesn't make me laugh. So I'll rephrase. Do Coppola's horror films aspire to scare people? I think Dementia 13 pretty clearly does. The film successfully fosters audience identification with Louise despite her immorality, and consequently, the scenes of her searching the Hollerans' mansion are suspenseful, bolstered still by the eerie score and the mystery surrounding Kathleen's death. Then of course, there's multiple scenes of a mad slasher shrouded in darkness cutting down screaming victims. And while not especially violent by modern standards, they certainly deliver on the gruesome expectations for exploitation horror in the early 60s. The grisly nature of the film's murders conformed to Stephen King's notion of the bad death. Characters in horror stories don't just die, they are eviscerated in brutal and grotesque ways. The bad death carries forth in Dracula, which is also far bloodier generally and even includes the off-screen devouring of an infant, something I suspect Corman would have bristled at in 1963. Yet I am less convinced that its intentions are to frighten than I am with Dementia 13. As Coppola himself has said, his Dracula is a love story, and perhaps less scary as a result. As the film's focus shifts away from Jonathan's powerlessness in Castle Dracula and towards Mina and the Count's mutual longing, the emotional tenor shifts from revulsion to fascination, and then attraction. And romance isn't confined to the characters either. The film's immense production value and the undeniable craftsmanship in its self-conscious visual effects are so grand and so awe-inspiring that the totality of the film is suffused with romantic power. Eroticism is not new to the Prince of Darkness. Film professor Peter Hutchings has described Dracula's appeal as primarily sexual, and since Bela Lugosi reconfigured the wretched monster from Stoker's novel into a dark and sophisticated gentleman, subsequent screen Draculas have emphasized the character's seductive, and sensual qualities. Coppola's films may have represented a culmination of Dracula as romantic figure, to again borrow from Hutchings, but sexy Dracula was not new. Indeed, horror monsters have been connected to sexuality since the early days of horror cinema, and many consciously evoke fear and desire. To quote film professor Rick Warland, the horror monster is often equal parts repulsive and compelling in the most effective and enduring horror tales. This is the dichotomy Coppola's Dracula zeroes in on, and in doing so, his film highlights the specific horror which comes from desire, of wanting something forbidden and even harmful. Before Dracula has even arrived in England, Coppola draws attention to Mina suppressing her desires, curious about her own sexuality and wants, but unwilling to actually face that part of herself. Horror film scholar Bruce F. Kawin has argued, great horror films don't seek to destroy us, but quote, to show us something we need to see. And that is exactly the role Dracula serves for Mina, forcing her to face the desires she has suppressed. There is a degree of fear in Mina giving herself over to temptation once faced with it, but there's also an undeniable erotic spell. We certainly see the destructive results loving Dracula unleashes on her, and can understand that their love is technically bad. This guy did kill a baby, after all, 
but the passion between them is so genuine, and each so devoted to the other's happiness, that it's also hard not to root for them at least a little bit. And the nice thing is, Coppola doesn't really resolve that tension. Mina kills Dracula to bring him peace, and is ostensibly freed from his vampiric influence, but still shows devotion to the Count. More obviously, the film closes on a glowing mural of Dracula with Mina, suggesting their souls remain entwined. This despite the fact that Mina is still married to Jonathan. Unlike Todd Browning's 1931 film, where Dracula's death restores Mina's virtue and lovers go forth unabated, Coppola suggests the perverse desires at hand may not be so easily remedied. This speaks to Coppola's readapting of familiar material to a new context, and this is also one of the key talking points when considering how scary Dracula is. In a 1999 essay, film critic Steven Schneider argued that audiences' overfamiliarity with fictional monsters like Dracula, the Wolfman, and Frankenstein's monster, quote, have rendered ineffective their efforts to horrify. The monsters are still threatening within their respective narratives, and the ideas which underpin them still powerful. But the familiar manner in which those ideas are represented cinematically no longer confronts viewers with an uncanny force capable of scaring them. And no horror icon is more familiar than Dracula. Over decades of adaptations, homages, and spoofs, Dracula became codified, mass-produced, and watered down. The simple image of a dark cloak, aristocratic garb, widow's peak, and fangs is as recognizable as Santa Claus, and possibly as nostalgic too. Hutchings has argued that John Badham's 1979 version of Dracula, with its Lugosi-looking count and traditional vampire movie iconography, is a nostalgia-tinged movie, one looking to horrors past with reverence rather than repulsion. To be sure, Coppola's Dracula is also nostalgia-tinged, and Hutchings cites it as such, its reverence for cinema's past far more explicit in fact. But the film also flatly rejects the classic Dracula iconography, particularly with Dracula himself. Aspects of Dracula's appearance resemble Stoker's description of an old man with white hair, but the beehive hairdo, red kimono, and muscle-like armor are all original to this film. Graphic artist Iko Ishioka's explicitly Japanese-inspired costumes both divorce Dracula from his existing iconography and re-emphasize his otherness, this sense of a foreign creature arriving on English shores. Taken in tandem, the film's visual strategy renders Dracula unfamiliar and uncanny, and in turn grants him the power to horrify once more. But I'm still not totally convinced Coppola cared that much about scaring people on this one. I'm not denying that terrorizing the audience was a goal with Dracula, but I don't think it was Coppola's only goal, or even his primary one. I keep coming back to Warland's line about the film. Everything becomes purely an image. Dracula is such a sumptuous feast of visual splendor, its spectacle so lovingly handcrafted, and its references to cinematic technique so self-conscious that it's hard to truly get lost in the horror. How can I be afraid when I'm so dazzled by the film's craft and beauty? That's not necessarily a flaw, as the film's aesthetic is extraordinary, and it also benefits the romance integral to Mina and Dracula's love affair. But it speaks to how Coppola drifts away from the traditional intent of horror and toward a romantic epic. And to that end, it's worth talking a bit about Coppola's influences on Dracula. Because for all the visual nods to the genre's great classics, or the plot similarities to the 1932 version of The Mummy, or Coppola's stated admiration for German Expressionism, there are also non-horror influences to be found. Worland notes the opening battle scene evokes Shakespeare adaptation Chimes at Midnight, and Coppola himself has claimed his staging of the climactic shootout was influenced by Stagecoach. And you know what film Coppola cites repeatedly in the commentary track as an influence? Jean Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast. A film which does have gothic iconography, 
the supernatural. Hell, it even has some spooky moments. But it's ultimately a fairy tale and a love story. Cocteau does generate some suspense and even apprehension of the beast early on, but any fear dissipates pretty quickly as Belle falls in love. A love so powerful, in fact, the film concludes with an image of pure transcendence. That a primary reference point for Dracula was a fairy tale romance where fear transforms into love is revealing of Coppola's intentions for his adaptation, but also his use of horror as a genre. He is attracted to many of the aesthetic elements of horror and how they can provide a playground for his own cinematic imagination, but his natural instincts are not to frighten. In theoretical terms, Dracula leans more on the semantics of horror than it does the syntax. This is a concept developed by film scholar Rick Altman in an essay which advocated for a dual approach for understanding film genre, concerned with both the building blocks of a genre, the semantic, and how those blocks are structured and organized within a text, the syntactic. A semantic definition of horror would consider recurring elements. Monsters, gothic settings, the threat of violence, blood, character types like the mad scientist, even stylistic devices like jump scares. A syntactic definition of horror looks at narrative structures and themes. The monster as a symbol of otherness encroaching on the familiar, the big death, the breakdown of established borders, the uncanny as a space for an ancient, primordial evil. Coppola's Dracula is overflowing with the semantics of the horror film, but its syntax is more complex. Some of horror's syntax can certainly be found, but with the love story comes also the syntax of romance. Societal oppression unlocked by erotic attraction, a love that transcends time and space, the choice between a boring nice guy who represents conformity and the sexy bad boy who represents deviance. And as Dracula unfolds, it is the romantic syntax which moves to the forefront as horror moves to the background. This recession would carry over into Twixt. Horror is present, but it's more of an afterthought. The film rarely, if ever, attempts to really scare. Even when Hall crosses over into a nightmare world and meets a vampire ghost child, he is far more bemused and curious than he is scared. Autumn Parker described the film as cozy, and I'm inclined to agree. The backdrop of a serial murderer and V's dark backstory suggest evil, but in practice there's little sense of threat. Hall himself wandering through his investigation with some detachment. Even the aesthetics of horror, though present, are breaking down. Twixt contains many hallmarks of the genre, but they don't look right. As Parker noted, there is a clash between the glossy sheen of digital and the elements of horror. We have dark forests, killings, an ominous clock tower, but it's all processed with this digital sheen. The film doesn't just feel unnatural, it feels wrong or at least it does by the standards of a horror movie. This is not how a horror story about murder in a gothic setting should look. This is. But unlike On Dementia 13, the Coppola of 2011 isn't all that interested in scaring an audience anymore. And for that matter, neither is Hall. His few efforts to take the violence around him and turn it into a scary story are transparently desperate and pathetic. He is utterly out of step with the horror. The real heart of the movie, for Hall and Coppola, is the grief over a deceased child, and it's the confrontation with that grief where Hall faces what happened and admits his own guilt for not being there that Twix comes into focus and achieves some manner of resolution. It's a moving climax to the story. Or at least it should be. But in the original cut of the film, Hall's confession is followed by a scene where Hall visits the mysterious corpse that has been held all film in the morgue, who in some shots is Hall's daughter, and in others is V. Hall removes the stake from her chest, blood rushes everywhere, and the girl emerges as V, who attacks Hall. <laughs> then the film suddenly smash cuts to Hall having sold a manuscript about vampires to his publisher. 
text tells us the book did okay sales-wise and credits roll. It's an odd stretch of film. The most overtly horrific set piece is revealed to be a fake-out, and the preceding text reads almost like a joke. It's revealing of how disinterested Twixt is in scaring an audience. Coppola will deliver a perfunctory horror set piece, drenched in blood and violence, only to immediately undercut it. But the brisk resolution and the sudden comedic shift don't just undercut the horror, they also undercut Hall's catharsis. You don't leave the film reflecting on loss and acceptance, you leave wondering if this whole thing was a joke. It also doesn't help that the text returns to the muddled details of the murder mystery rather than the emotional clarity of Hall's arc. I have to assume Coppola agrees, because his 2022 re-edit Betwixt Now and Sunrise moves the morgue scene far earlier, and the film now ends with Hall's confession on the cliffside. It's a change that doesn't radically transform Twixt, but it does clarify its intentions. As a movie which utilizes the semantics of horror, not as a device to frighten, but to stir intrigue in what is fundamentally a character study and an expression of Coppola's own grief. And this cuts to the core of how Coppola approaches horror as a genre. In essence, the horror cinema of Francis Ford Coppola is a cinema of utility. Horror was useful for Francis, economically to be sure, but also as a testing ground, as a launchpad for cinematic experimentation, and as a vessel for exploring the most painful parts of his life. That's not to say Coppola's use of horror is entirely cynical or self-serving. There is clear love for the genre's constituent elements, but Coppola is not reverential of the genre in and of itself. He is only drawn to horror when it can most benefit him, and is otherwise uninterested. And even when he is interested, he is more compelled by the aesthetics of horror than he is its intentions. It's not a coincidence that the more authority Coppola yields over these films, the less inclined they are to scare the audience. Even more than the overshadowing legacy of his 70s masterpieces, this is what really accounts for Coppola's lack of consideration as a horror director. But he is a horror director, just paradoxically, a horror director who doesn't make scary movies. Horror is a framework that he will play with and morph to his own ambitions, but it's not an ethos he will commit himself to. And while that might disqualify Coppola of the label Master of Horror, it's also what makes his horror cinema that much more fascinating. In divorcing horror from the impetus to frighten, Coppola both expands the aesthetic parameters of horror cinema, even when drawing influence from its traditional iconography, and allows for alternative types of emotional engagement. And this is why it is essential that we study the horror cinema of Francis Ford Coppola, not merely as a microcosm for tracing the artistic evolution of its auteur, but as a glimpse of a canvas painted by an artist unbound by the traditional expectations of the form. Coppola has not directed the most horror films, nor has he directed the best, but no one else's horror films are quite like this. If you enjoyed this video and want to hear me talk horror and Dracula specifically a bit more, you can head on over to my Patreon, where $5 patrons can watch a tier ranking of the classic Universal monster movies, from Dracula to The Creature Walks Among Us. Thank you for watching, and Happy Halloween! <laughs>